welcome to First Congregational Church. We are so pleased to have you here worshiping with us today. Just a reminder, we'll be out there on the website, YouTube, Facebook. Be sure and let your friends know that we are always out there. Uh, and of course, we always welcome them to come and worship with us on Sunday mornings. Wow, my first thankful praise this morning. Sunshine, two days in a row, feels like a mini miracle, doesn't it? Yay! Also so thankful for the special music this morning, Lorraine. Always a delight to have you at the organ and our praise team here to uh, joyously lead us in worshiping our, our Lord today. Reminder that our collection plates are still in the narthex and will be brought forward uh, for placement on the altar in doxology. Also still a basket for donations for True North Food Pantry. And just a reminder also that you're welcome to join us downstairs for fellowship. Every Sunday of worship there, we have coffee and refreshments. And I want to sure hope that you all have a wonderful day today. Praise God. Good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to see you all. Excuse me. I accidentally turned off my microphone, not turned it on. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to see you all. Uh, like Stacy said, it is so nice to see the sun. Um, I think I was reading the news the other day, and they said for the last month, whenever the article was published, uh, there had only been about five minutes of sunshine. So uh, I kind of, uh, yesterday when it came out in the morning, I suddenly felt this overwhelming urge to frolic, which <laughs> is very unusual for me. I'm not exactly the frolicking kind, but you know, when the mood hits you, you gotta kind of roll with it. So, um, my frolic is not very elegant though, you know, it's more of a stumble. My wife was very worried about me. She thought something had gone wrong. Uh, but anyways, welcome everyone. I hope you enjoy this uh, beautiful day that the, you enjoy the sunshine while it lasts. Um, who knows uh, what our weather is going to do. It's been very strange. So um, I'm Pastor Luke, and this uh, is just a beautiful day to worship the Lord here at First Congregational Church. Let us go to our call to worship taken from Psalm 40. I wait patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me my, and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offerings you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. Then I said, here I am in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I will delight to do your will. O oh my God, your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance to the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips as you know, O oh Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have gathered us together today to worship you, to glorify your name. I pray that you bless this time, that you bless each and every one of us. Pour out your Holy Spirit in this place. Let it flow through us that we may draw close to you and that we may become the disciples you have called us to be. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. You know, Jesus, I hope you have too. So please stand. That's number 602. And we have I decided to follow Jesus.
I've always loved the metaphor of a journey, the following Jesus as a journey. I suspect it's from reading the Lord of the Rings one too many times and being infected by it, but this idea that our life following Christ is a journey out of the world of sin into our heavenly home. And I love how it declares there'll be no turning back. But the truth is, as we walk our path, we all too often stumble and fall. And yet the beauty of that is that does not mean that Christ throws us out and says, you can no longer follow me. He says, ask for forgiveness. Stand up and keep on going. And so let us take a moment to look back on our week, to look into our heart and see how we have stumbled and fallen. And then let us bring that before our Heavenly Father and ask for forgiveness. Let us have a moment of silence. Forgive our faithlessness, O faithful God, and see beyond our apathy, our thoughtlessness, our self-centeredness, our wrong choices. See into our hearts, for you are our treasure. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here's the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proved God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. from the New Revi International Version. First reading is from Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He has made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that for my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and the Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down. 
because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians verse 1 through 9. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sasthenes. To the church of God in Corinth, to whose those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Gospel reading is from John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which tr translated is Peter. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have noticed a theme in our readings today. Uh, not always is there a clear theme in our in electionary readings. Sometimes there's one passage that is clearly required. I mean, on Christmas, it'd be very odd if, you know, we didn't read about the birth of Jesus or on the baptism of Jesus. We didn't read the passage on the baptism of Jesus. And Sometimes there's one or two passages or two passages that really go together. And then on other occasions, it really feels like the people who put together the lectionary were like, well, we got to get these three passages in. So guess what? They're going on August, the fourth Sunday of August, and they just don't have any connection. And then other times there are readings like today where all three seem to really bind together. The theme, I suspect you noticed, is of calling. All three deal with this idea of the call or of being called. In Isaiah, we see the calling of the suffering servant, as this figure is often called, in the womb. 
Paul speaks of his calling as an apostle and the calling of the Corinthians. And in John, we find Jesus called by a new name, and then Simon, or as we know him, Peter, being called a new name, Cephas or Peter, which is actually the, those are the same name. One is Aramaic and one is Greek. They both mean rock. So Jesus basically walked up to Peter and said, ah, you're not a Simon anymore. You're, you're rocky and renamed him. So we find a, our readings are talking about this idea of calling. And the idea of calling is a, it's a kind of a complex one. It's one of those core themes or ideas in faith, in our Christian faith, but one that isn't often unpacked. There's often the literal use of calling where, you know, we all have done this, where we call out for somebody, hey, you, come here, or person I want to talk to, or child I love, but right now I want to throw out the window, stop doing whatever it is you're doing. We've all had that calling. We all do it at times. Then there's also this metaphorical use of the term calling, where someone feels like they are called to do something, whether that's a call to ministry or a call to a job or a call to do some gesture, whether it's to take care of a person or to do some grand thing. Uh, usually when we talk about calling in this way, it's, it's a calling to something that I guess you wouldn't normally do, or it's to something done out of love or passion or need or duty, you know. Uh, no one feels called to go treat themselves to the day at a spa or to buy themselves a fancy car or um, very rarely people are called to be accountants. Not, to, not that there's something wrong with accounting, but you know, you, feel, you hear people talking about being called to be a teacher or uh, in my line of work, people are called to ministry. Often it's something that people are giving up other things. We think of this if we feel called to honor a person or to do something when somebody passes away, you know, go to a grave. You're giving up time and effort and money to do an honor or do something called to serve the poor. No one's ever been called to be the plastic surgeon to the rich and famous and, you know, have that hard life of living in Hollywood and driving a Ferrari. Sometimes I wish God would call me to Hawaii, you know, but he just, that one just has not worked out yet. So we'll see. Maybe when I retire, he'll call me out there to go live on the beach. But calling is drawing together. In many ways, that's what it is to be called. It pulls people together. When I call to my daughter, it's pulling her towards me. And when we use this in Christian terms, in Christianity, we talk about pulling or a change to or drawing to, to God. That's what we mean when we say we are called. When I say I was called to ministry, it means I was drawn to God and changed my course. Quite literally, when I was called to ministry, I had little interest in being a pastor. When you are a pastor's son, everybody walks up to you and says, do you want to be a pastor? Oh, you want to be a pastor like your dad. And I would respond, no, I do not. I see what they do and what they go through, and you have to be crazy to do that. I wanted to be, I don't know what I wanted to be, uh, depended on the day. Some days a lawyer, some days a history teacher. Some, day I just wanted to, some days I just wanted to get paid for playing Halo and drinking Mountain Dew. You know, I hadn't thought about it that much. And then, bam, I find myself called into ministry. It quite literally went like this. One day I was walking into a service. I worked as a, one of the youth assistants in a, at our church. And I was walking into a, a church service uh, with the youth that we had a winter camp meeting. And so I wandered in just thinking it was going to be another service. And then two hours later, because we liked long services, I wander out and suddenly God has changed everything and I'm called to ministry. And to just confirm that I hadn't eaten bad pizza that day, my pastor actually walked up, and I kind of thought this, I'm like, if this is actually a thing, 
Somebody's going to say something. Literally the next Sunday, my pastor walks up and says, Hey, Luke, I think you're called to ministry. You need to join our young minister's group. And so I'm like, well, okay. Thank you, God. I, I need the good hit upside the head with the two by four to get stuff. And so off I went. I was, I was suddenly changed. Everything was different. And my life has looked very different since that call. If it was up to me, I'd still be living in Appleton, Wisconsin, where I was born. I never wanted to leave. I was going to find some job there. Didn't matter if I... I would have found something because what I cared about was being in that place. And so God called me and suddenly I was going this way and I veered off this way, which is how I ended up in Fremont, Michigan. Never heard of the place, would have never come here if I was just going to continue down walking my path. And I suspect that many here have a call story of their own, whether it's as grand, I don't know if mine is grand, but you know, if it's as life altering as a call to ministry, or if it's something smaller, a call to faith, you were off doing something and suddenly you felt God pull you by the lapels into act of faith, or maybe an act of service, or an act, you were called to do some grand act to help someone. We've all felt in some way or another a call to do something. You're walking down one path and suddenly you veered off another. And you have been called. So calling is one of these subtle but important ideas. And today I wanted to look at what it means to be called. I think there's three aspects, although there's probably a lot more that we see from our passages. First, we start off with Jesus, who is the called one, or the source of our calling. Second, our own calling, and how we are all called to service, to ministry. We all have work we are called to do in the kingdom of heaven. And then finally, we are called together. We are gathered together. We begin with Jesus Christ because we always begin with Jesus Christ. Everything we do as Christians begins with him. And Jesus Christ is the called one. He's the Messiah, the anointed one. In Isaiah, this is a beautiful passage that since the coming of Jesus has been applied to him. And we see how in that passage, prophetically, it's speaking of how Jesus was called from the very moment of conception. In the womb, he was called to serve. He is also the one we call out to and the one who calls us. We see this very clearly in John 1. If you look at our reading, it actually feels a little strange. I've read it when I first was looking over what to preach for today. I read John 1. I'm like, why would they do that? It feels like this awkward transition passage, as if you're reading a novel and it's that paragraph where oh the hero stops and takes a break at the hotel and gets a you know eats a nice meal and then the story goes on but john the author of this gospel is fairly clever there's a reason why john is the one in the lectionary that gets read every single year because he packs in theological depth even in these transition passages we see in this passage that Jesus actually doesn't seem to do much. He's almost, it almost feels like a ghost story. You know, the ghost comes through and everybody freaks out. And in this passage, Jesus just kind of wanders on by. And then John, it's like, whoa. Then he wanders by again. And then these two guys peel off. He wanders in again. And suddenly Simon's getting called Rocky, which was not a common name at the time. It'd be like walking up to somebody and say, Lou, I'm changing your name. It's going to be Wall now. Everybody call Lou Wall from this time on. He's just like, nope, I'm going to come in here and just mix things up. So Jesus has been baptized. It says one day earlier he was baptized. He is now in active ministry. This is his moment. The light has gotten turned green. He's moving. And he is called to speak. So the next day, he wanders by. I don't know if he was camped out nearby. And John does probably his most important thing. He models what it means to be a Christian. He's living it out. 
and he preaches the gospel. And he sees Jesus and he cries out, Behold, the Lamb of God. What I found interesting while reading up on this is every commentary is like, yeah, we don't know where that comes from. The Lamb of God who's redeeming this, this is, you know, they have all these guesses and you know, all these smart people have all these things they talk about and none of them seem to realize, like, maybe John just came up with this in the moment. But John calls Jesus a new name. Calling has a way of changing who we are. It changes who we are. When, we, when a person becomes a parent, they're no longer the same person. When Nora was born, I'm no longer Luke. I'm dad. Our name changes when we are called. No longer am I Luke. I'm Pastor Luke. It, everything changes. I cannot act the way I could when I was in college. Things are different now. I can't just walk down the street and act the same way because I am a new person. Change, call, ch change results in a complete change in who we are. And so John calls Jesus this new name, revealing his work and mission in the world to take away the sins of the world. He goes on to explain who Christ is and call out the truth that Christ brings a greater baptism, a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Calling begins with Christ, the chosen one, the one called in the womb. Jesus is the center of all things, like literally the center of all things, just not the center of all we do. Although, if you think about it, we're called Christians, which means little Christs. It's everything we do. But he is also the literal cosmic hero of the universe, the center of all stories, the one that all truth points to. And all emptiness longs to be filled with. He is the stop and start of all stories. And as Christians, all we do is built on him. And as he has been called, that calling reflects down to us. He is called and it flows out of him to us. Which brings us to the second calling. The one that, in some ways, we think about more. It's the calling of the disciples. I love how in here, John, who you would think would be a little concerned about losing his disciples, but he's like, hey, that's the Lamb of God. And if you're a truth seeker like these two disciples, Andrew and this unnamed one, you would think, you'd know that they are going to go follow this guy. And that's what happens. We find two truth seekers, two guys who are giving up everything to seek the truth. And at the time, that was not an easy thing to do. You see, you can't just go work at Starbucks in, you know, first century Palestine and then spend your time, you know, studying. If you don't work, you're not eating. Maybe you get a few blueberries off the side of the road, but that's about it. So these guys really gave up a lot. And then they see truth and they start following him. There's this beautiful thing where you can go in the Greek and there's this term remain that is used over and over again. The Holy Spirit remains in Christ. And then Andrew and this other disciple asked to remain with Christ. It's this beautiful example of what we are called to do. Jesus turns to these two following him and asks, what are you looking for? What are you doing? And they answer, we want to stay with you. Teacher. You know the truth. You're the Lamb of God, whatever that means, but we want to be with you. We know a good thing when we see it. And so he calls them, come and see. Peter's calling is even more dramatic. Andrew hangs out with Jesus for a while and then he's like, this is good. I got to go get my brother here. Simon, come. I have found the Messiah. And so Simon rolls in. I don't know how much of the story is left out here. I don't know if it's literal in this place where Simon rolls in, shakes Jesus' hand, and Jesus is like, mm, I got a new name for you, dude. Or not, but it, his calling is so powerful, everything is changed. He gets a new name. I love how this passage start, opens and closes with new names given. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. Simon 
is called the rock, revealing their role in salvation history. Jesus as Messiah and Peter as the leader of the 12 disciples or apostles. It's interesting that Jesus' first work is to call followers and to create disciples. It's a key dynamic of our faith. We see this circle time and time again. Jesus reveals himself. Truth is called out and then disciples are called in. And then it goes on over and over again. Jesus shows himself, we hear the gospel, we become disciples, and then we do the same. This is how Christ battles sin and evil, by redeeming and making holy one person at a time, and then calling them to mission. This is what it means that each and every Christian is a called person, because each and every one of us is given a job and a role in the kingdom. There's this thought that, oh, the minister, they're the called one, so they do all the stuff. We hire them to do the work. But you read in the Bible, and that is absolutely not how it is. Every person is called to mission. We all have different jobs and roles in the church. And in many ways, our jobs and roles change throughout our life. We might start out very active in one way, and then we end our lives maybe in a as a person of prayer. We all do what we are called to. God doesn't call me to repairing things because I barely know which side of the hammer you're supposed to use. That God doesn't call me to be a trustee or to work in business because I don't have a head for it. But some people, they're gifted in that area, so God calls them to that. Each and every one of us has been given a role and a job. There is no person who God does not use. There's no such thing as a useless person in God's kingdom. To be a Christian means to be a disciple, who, and a disciple is one who studies, lives, recruits, and works for the master. A disciple is dis- disciplined in his or her work that he is or her are called to. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, speaking of the church in Corinth, we are called to be saints, or holy ones, which is what saints means. God calls people to come to him and receive grace. This is the third calling we see. It's this call to community. We can't be Christians on our own. It's a fundamental truth. Jesus isn't baptized, then just goes off on his own. He's not like the hero in some western who is alone. You see him riding over some beautiful hill on his horse, and that's it. And then he faces everyone, all the bad guys, alone. No. He literally, the first thing he does, you would think he has some, somewhere in the back of his mind, like, I don't got a lot of time. I got three years to do all this work. I'm just going to go off and do it. But no, the first thing he does is he brings believers in. Sometimes we feel like that with our own call. Oh, I'm called to do this or that thing. So I'm just going to go out. I don't need other people to do what I'm called to do. But it's this important point that Jesus calls people together. The very term church does not mean building. We come to think of this building as the church, but the truth is church means a gathering of people. It's quite literal. The translation comes from the Greek, and the Greek term just is a gathering, a crowd, people drawn to one place. Because you could burn this building down and you would not remove First Congregational Church from the world. You just remove our building. And God did not call us to do our mission alone. We're not called to do and face the world on our own, just as Jesus did not do his mission alone and in the world. Rather, we are gathered together as a people of God. The gathered saints do the work. We do that work through worship. What we are doing here today, our singing of praise, our prayer, our asking of forgiveness, this is the work of the people. We hear the preaching We receive the sacraments of communion and baptism done by, with, and for the church. These are all communal things we do. The church is the tool God uses to work in the world. 
God draws people together to form a community and to work together. Jesus is the chosen one, the called one, called from the womb, and he is calling you. The question we face today is, will we answer that call? Will you become a disciple? Will you do the work that Jesus is calling you to do? Are you willing to change what you are doing? Will you join his people in the work they have been called to? It's the answer that we face each and every morning. God is calling me. Will I say yes to his call? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the call that you have given each and every one of us. That call that has taken us from one path, as it's put in the Bible, the path of destruction, that has drawn us to the path of life. I pray that you give us the courage and the strength to always respond to your call, to follow you as you have called us to do, Lord. I pray that if there is a person here today who may be struggling with that call, whatever that call may be, whether it's the call to faith or it's the call to ministry or it's just the call to a new level or a different kind of service in your church, that you give them the strength to follow you. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
singing his praises. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you do. I thank you for your blessings and your grace, for the goodness you pour out, for the love that you share with us. Lord, you see all the needs shared here today. We pray that you answer them. We lift up my family and the tragic death that they are dealing with. Lord, I pray for continued comfort and strength through this time. I pray for Jack and Mary as they travel down to Florida for safety and for rest and relaxation. I pray for this move and thank you for that. I pray for Kathy and the surgery that she is going with her eyes. I pray for wisdom for the surgeons for a quick recovery. I lift up Joan Jansma as she continues to battle cancer. I pray that she has good outcomes and that she recovers fully from this. I pray for Tim who tore his t a tendon in his arm. I pray for a quick healing and for freedom from pain for this. I, Thank you for Lisa's ministry and for the great results coming forward. I pray for continued blessing on that. I lift up Jean and Dean's grandson who's struggling with this move. I pray that you give him comfort in this time and you help him to quickly find community and a place to belong and friends. I also lift up our leaders, Lord, that you have put over us. I lift up our president and governor 
and representative and mayor, Lord. Give them wisdom and guidance so that they can fulfill their duties well and in a way that pleases you, Lord. I also pray for a blessing on Fremont. Let it be a place of peace and prosperity. And Lord, I also pray that you help us to fulfill your mission in our community, Lord. Give us strength and wisdom and guidance to do what you have called us to do in this place. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for our doxology.